Hold tap, hold tap, yeah. Here we are once again, the Malefe Kete Asante Institute. We are here, Germantown Avenue in Philadelphia, and the struggle continues. In an age where they're talking about banning books and they're trying to control curriculum and keep the lies going, we have more information to edify and uplift our people. And before we do anything this great and this important, it's always you know, vital that we call upon the ancestors. And at this time, we're going to have the good brother Ransom do a libation. And then after that, we'll have an official introduction of our guest speaker for today. Welcome. Everyone who has died or made transition is an ancestor. We stand on the shoulders of those who have come before us. Therefore, I will do an ancestral prayer, and at which time I will pour libation. I give praise to the omnipotent creator. I give praise to the light and energy of the four directions. I give praise to the light and energy of the air I breathe, the water which sustains life, the fire which cleanses the earth, and the earth which holds me up. I give praise to all the honored ancestors who are seated at the feet of the creator, having completed their work on this earth. I give praise to my ancestors who are buried in the soil of Africa and the Caribbean. I give praise to my ancestors who died in the Middle Passage. I give praise to my ancestors who are buried in the soil of North America, whom the Native Americans call Turtle Island. I give praise to my ancestors who are buried in the soil of Central America. I give praise to my ancestors who are buried in the soil of South America. I give praise to my ancestors whose blood runs through my veins, and yet their names are not known. I give praise to my ancestors who walk with me, who look for me, who guide and protect me. Spirits, I welcome you. I offer you water to purify you of the bondages of your life. I ask you, spirit mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, and friends to remember me in your travels. Protect me, guide me, assist me, and all members of our family, living and dead. I am in need of your assistance at all times to overcome challenges and obstacles with money, health, employment, recovery, wisdom, musical ecstasy, spiritual ecstasy, and my own mortal progress. I thank you for your guidance. I thank you for your intercession, good spirits. Good spirits, carry my prayers with you to the feet of the creator. Still my heart and my mind with perfect peace and resolve. I thank you for bringing the perfect solution in the perfect time for the best of all involved. I say. I say. Hotel. Wow, that brother, that brother feels the spirit that we all feel. He was very powerful. We're delighted to have Brother Ransom here. Uh, hotel, hotel again. I just want to say that uh, the Maleficati Asante Institute for Afrocentric Studies is a non-profit, um, not-for-profit, uh, educational, charitable organization, and we are very delighted 
to see those of you who have come and the many of you who are on uh, live streaming. It's a very good thing uh, to come and to associate uh, with other people who have wisdom. And when I look at the audience, I see incredible wisdom here. Um, our people are extend uh, from various ages, but they come from many experiences. And they have many uh, opportunities and have had many opportunities to understand and to see the work that can be done and needs to be done. We're living at a time, of course, in which there's a rising tide of fascism. Uh, but fascism is not just a political movement. It's a movement in all corporations. It's a movement in education. It's a movement in religion. You see it everywhere, in the economy and so forth. And that's the attitude that really uh, destroys the notion of humanity and the ideas that have been at the very root and the foundation of African people uh, from the very beginning. And we, we did not create Ma'at without having some understanding of the observations of what uh, human beings did in response uh, to the environment and in response to uh, their relationships with each other. Just today, uh, here at the Institute, and we have so many great things that happen at this Institute, a lady who is no normally known as Mary from Nicetown, if you watch or you hear uh, WRD, uh, came all the way up from, she's moved, she's down in North Carolina. She came all the way up from North Carolina, got here around three o'clock, and said, Dr. Asante, uh, there's something I want to give you. And she had a gift of, uh, from Africa that she gave me, and she said, I want to tell you something. She said, um, you have inspired me. I listened to Michael Cord, and I had listened to you years ago, and I listened to the rapping professor. And she says that my knowledge of myself has increased enormously by listening to you. And she, she said, and I said, well, how did you get here, Sister Mayor? She said, well, my family is with me. They didn't want to come. I took the bus in the rain to get here just to be able to give you this piece of art from Africa. And uh, I, I, I said to myself, those are the moments that we live for because we live for these moments when people appreciate the idea of knowledge. She said that she didn't know anything until she started listening to WRD. And she said she was shocked that African people had done so much. And so today I am so happy to be able to introduce our speaker. Uh, our speaker is one who lives and has worked and studied in the traditions of the greatest women in our tradition. Uh, Anna Julia Cooper, who went back to college when she was uh, over 60 years old. Uh, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, whom we celebrated recently in Atlantic City. Uh, with a statue to uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, who represented a person who understood that uh, she was uh, tired of this whole idea of being tired, sick and tired. And she uh, stood up for the voting rights of the African people in Mississippi. Uh, and Diane Nash, who many people don't re remember, but Diane Nash was the woman who led the civil rights movement as a student. She was a, a junior at Fisk University when I was graduating from high school in Nashville. And she led the movement against segregation in the establishment, the commercial establishment in Nashville, Tennessee. And I was one of her foot soldiers. And Diane Nash uh, has gone on and most people, I mean, she's still alive, but most people don't know her, don't remember her. But she was a dynamic leader of the civil rights movement in Nashville, Tennessee. We have, a, we have many women who have 
just done outstanding things. Mary McLeod Bethune comes to my mind, you know, because uh, I read her last will and testament to black people. And that was an inspiration to me, what she left to us, what she wanted to leave to us. This was a very powerful thing. So I am delighted today to have the opportunity to introduce a woman whose work in Africa, in, in Europe, uh, in, in Australia, among the native peoples, and her work uh, certainly in uh, uh, Philadelphia and the United States of America, her work has inspired a lot of people. People uh, write to her and ask for her participation from Brazil to South Africa uh, to, to, to Europe. I mean, she's engaged in many conversations. Most people don't have any idea what she's engaged in in terms of her conversation. And that's the great Dr. Na Dove. She will be our speaker today. Dr. Dove uh, received her PhD at the State University of New York in Buffalo. And not only that, but she has uh, lived in uh, Ghana and also in Nigeria, as well as in Europe and Canada. So we're, we're delighted that this author of the book, The Afrocentric School, is going to be our speaker today. And not only uh, is she the author of the Afrocentric School, but she is the author of the first book called African Mothers. And that book was published by SUNY Press uh, some years ago. In addition to that, she is the co-author of the book, Being Human Being. Uh, this is a powerful book about how you transform the race paradigm into the human paradigm. It's actually um, one of the uh, few books, I think, that tries to show that Afrocentricity is about humanity. And it's always been about humanity. It's not been about a, pro, uh, a narrow provincialism uh, that, that's tied into a, a, a bottleneck or somehow uh, got people walking around in a situation where uh, there's no end to where they're going. I mean, it's like circular. No. Afrocentricity starts in Africa. Remember, well, Homo sapiens started Africa. Not only do Homo sapiens start in Africa, but in the end, we all understand that there's one race, and that's the human race. But we also understand that racism can exist without race. Race may be a biological illusion, but racism is a reality, and so we fight against racism, but we fight against all domination, wherever domination is, wherever oppression is, we fight against it. Our only moral and ethical position has always got to be that Afrocentrists, and particularly people who call themselves Africologists, only work in the interest of justice and bringing about freedom from all forms of hierarchy and patriarchy. And so I am delighted. I mean, I know that next week we're going to have Dr. Jabali Ade. Uh, he's going to be speaking about artificial intelligence and interface with our faces and something like that. We are so happy to uh, have Dr. Um, Jabali com coming next week. I mean, not next week. It's the 10th. I'm sorry. Forgive me. <laughs> Dr. Jabal, I had you coming next week. We don't have anything next week. But, we're, but we will, on, on, on December the 10th, Dr. Jabali Ade, the rapping professor, will be here. But for now, we have this outstanding uh, uh, professor, scholar, teacher, and one of the uh, most popular graduate professors we have at Temple University, Dr. Na Dove. Dr. Dove, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Asante, and uh, Anna, Director, Dr. Asante, President of the Institute, um, the MKA Institute. I'm saying thank you because this is a safe space. Yeah. Students have told me that in my classroom, and uh, it's a great honor 
to be here where we can uh, meet together and say uh, our, our true thoughts without being um, challenged, let's say. Um, so I thank you for that. Um, I'm, I'm very humbled also by all these wonderful women that came before me. I'm just a shadow of any of them. So, uh, but I'm inspired, obviously, by all. So thank you for the wonderful compliment. Um, I uh, wrote the book, The Afrocentric School, um, in 2021. It was published um, as a way to uh, bring together all the knowledge from all the people that I have ever known who have developed alternative schools to the to the dominant cultural schools that want us to remain um, without knowledge of who we actually are. And they're really the same today as they were uh, when I first became part of a movement in the UK to develop Saturday schools to challenge the uh, system so that the children uh, could understand uh, their own potential, which the schools were destroying at that time. And uh, when I came to the US, I joined, I was lucky enough to, uh, in, in getting my doctorate at, at Buffalo, SUNY, I met Dr. Mwalimu Shuja, who was uh, associated, actually, uh, he was the uh, director of the Council of Independent Black Institutions, and he worked with Dr. Kofi Lomote to uh, create uh, an organization um, that was an umbrella organization to all the Afrocentric schools in the country, in this country. And um, I had the opportunity then as a member of CB to be able to travel and visit these schools and see the wonderful women and men who had created these schools. And so really the book really represents the knowledge that I've gained. And if I tried to say thank you to everybody, that's all I'd be doing while I'm standing here. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Ah, Afrocentric theory has been the basis of uh, the becoming an Afrocologist, which I am. And um, I just wanted to take two quotes that I thought would be important to start. Um, there is nothing more important, said Dr. Asante, for children than the application of knowledge for the interpretation of their own histories, experiences, and possibilities. Um, he wrote that in my book, and um, uh, it's inspiring in, in the work because he's been part of the uh, infusion system in across the country um, where Afrocentric ideas, history, culture, logic, and so on have been infused into the schools that would allow any type of discussion about Africa in relation to the students, um, in relation to the black students there. So uh, he has had that expertise and written several books on, on African history. And here I am, while African Americans exist within the US social context, they also exist within an African historical cultural continuum that predates that social context and would continue to exist even if the nation state and its societal arrangements were to transform or demise. This is from uh, Dr. Mwali Mushuja, and what he's essentially saying is that the culture of African people is one that continues, and that if we're able to link into it, we can become part of the memory and remembering who we actually are. 
and whatever happens here, that will always remain, which I think are very important words and fundamental to uh, teaching our children. Um, I start with Africa because Africa is the birthplace of humanity, the land of the first humans, mm -hmm. culture, speech, languages, civilizations, sciences, symbols, writing, songs, music, dancing, societies, institutions, spiritual beliefs, and also um, uh, democracy, the idea of democracy. And this is important because a lot of the information that we receive when we're looking at the ancient peoples, who were they, where they came from, is very made mystical and strange, and people are given different names um, to really mask the fact that they were all actually African. So, you know, they're, they're invented names usually to do with the people who have funded um, the, uh, the excavations and archaeological finds. So often people are just called the name of the person who who has funded finding the bones. And so we think of these strange people with these strange civilizations. Um, and all of them are really African, but it, it's, it's a way of masking and hiding. And it's part of the confusion that the archeologists and scientists have had themselves um, because they're steeped in race and racism. And so they've been I unable to identify the bones and bodies that they found because they cannot believe that African people uh, could have uh, achieved the great things that have been achieved in history. Um, so there are two oppositional cultures in existence which span out into many, many cultures. One, African matriarchy, the first culture, the other, Euro-Southwest Asian patriarchy. Um, as African people migrated and populated the world, some maintained their African beliefs in the equality of women and men, the potential mothers and fathers of existence. This balanced relationship created Ma'at, the oldest ethical system that is known. For some Africans, owing to climatic difficulties, African matriarchal culture was destroyed and patriarchal cultures arose for those people. The debasement of the mother created the first hierarchy of injustice, the opposite of Ma'at, the order of life. Those who lost touch with their African ancestors returned to Africa thousands of years later to plagiarize African knowledge and steal African wealth. Um, this is very fundamental to the book. In fact, this is the theory behind the book. And so it's not a book for everyone, as you can tell. <laughs> but um, nonetheless, that's, that's the foundation of the book. The importance of culture, because it's a culturally informed book, culturally oriented book toward Africa. Culture itself is transmitted through behaviors, beliefs, and values from our ancestors to our descendants, quite simply put. It's historical, psycho-spiritual, and linguistic. The evidence of culture's existence is in the way that we think and produce things from architecture to art, all these human ways, all these human productions. We create institutions to reflect and maintain our cultural beliefs and values. So every society, no matter how small and no matter how large, creates institutions to reflect and maintain the cultural beliefs and values of that, those people wherever they are. Now, institutions, 
the mind is such a critical part of existence. It shapes culture and culture shapes the mind. One uses the mind to understand reality or what's going on in, in the world. And the major institutions that impact the development of the mind, body and soul are, because remember that the mind actually is not separate from the body and the soul and the spirit. That is all part of the mind. We tend to dissect it in a Eurocentric way so that we can control all these aspects. But it is part of oneness. Um, the family is one institution, number one, designs early relationships, education, production of knowledge based on truth, spiritual systems, ways that one conducts a relationship to the source of life as one understands it, healthcare, looking after the mind, body and soul, politics, ideas that help us organise socially in the best interests of societies, Entertainment, human acts, creative artistic skills, music, sculptures, events, rituals that can bring us together to enjoy and appreciate. Seven, economic and financial affairs and trading. And eight, governance, laws and policies. So whichever culture that you're in, these are the institutions that maintain that culture. And we have a special understanding of that. Um, all institutions are material reflections of the cultures that form them. Racist theoretical constructs of evolution and progress place Africa on the margins of civilization and imply that before Indo-Aryans, European, Southwest Asian people, Africa had accomplished nothing. We were subhumans genetically or sinners. Polygenism, a theory of race, that human races arose from different parts of the world, Asia, Europe and China essentially, implies different species that were not even the same humans. Um, from religions to academics, many still use this theory. It's not... Uh, Essentially, it's not spoken about, but it, if you listen really to what people say, you find that there's a lot of this belief still hanging in the air with a lot of writings. That's why people begin histories from strange places, because they believe in that the beginnings of their history had nothing to do with Africa, which is scientifically not true. Um, science shows that according to the mitochondrial DNA, we are all related to one African mother. The cultural belief in race and the inferiority of African black humanity is the foundation of Eurocentric, Southwest Asian centric academic disciplines and, and religions. Now, this school embodies these ideas. These, these ideas are the background to how the book is, is written and explained. It's an educational book, and in terms of education, uh, it's very important in, as an institutional structure, but for different cultures, um, education is a different thing. For education for us, is not education because if you don't know who you are, if the culture that dominates you is trying to create uh, an under a falsehood about your character and despises your humanity, clearly this is not your culture. And we are in this place at the moment in a culture that has debased African humanity for centuries. And, um, you know, so education in this light is about coming to know who one is. So for the children, it's coming to appreciate who they are and therefore the potential uh, for the future. Um, I put on the front here, um, excuse me, I...
Well, I can't find it, so <laughs> it's, it doesn't matter. Um, so on the front here is the uh, picture here that I painted here, which is more colourful because um, it is African and, you know, over the thousands of years colours have faded, but so much is still there, which just shows you how amazing uh, the colours were at that time and what they used to bring those colours to life. Um, so this is really uh, Ani and Tutu, his wife. They are um, priest and priestess who are coming to have their hearts weighed against the feather of truth before they enter uh, the, the world um, where they will go through a number of obstacles before they become uh, ancestors. And so this is just the image of the ancient comedic idea of go moving into ancestorhood. So they are married and they, it, it, when you look at the picture, this picture is actually in the British Museum and it's part of a, you know, yards long. Whenever uh, we talk about these books, the book of coming forth by day, they're actually one long, long papyri, feet and yards long. And in the British Museum and other museums all over the world, they just chop a, a piece off. And so it, it encourages us to go to look at all these pieces and think that they're part of a book that we are used to today when they're not. They're a complete story. But this one is in the British Museum and you have um, Aunt Pooh, who is by the Feather of Truth. You have the baboon, which is another image of Jehuti, who is seen here, the god of knowledge and wisdom, who's seen here as an ibis-headed god, who's writing down the life that you've lived. And um, you have the bar here, the human-headed bird that is carrying the spirit. And um, so here uh, you have uh, the devourer who is Amut. And if you have not lived a life that you have tried to change the world, try to do something for your community, for your people, for your family, that has tried to improve the circumstances and create a, a better situation then you will um then you will your hearts will not uh weigh the the feather mm -hmm. the the weight of the feather and our moots will devour your heart and in that way you cannot become an ancestor mm -hmm. um the seven liberal arts were created in africa practiced in the temple universities of Kemet, and they provided the knowledge to know oneself. And in fact, they are uh, also very important to the book, and that's how it's divided. Um, so each of the years of the children's experience are divided into these liberal arts, and they cross over. Although they hear separately grammar, rhetoric, logic, mathematics, geometry, astronomy, music, the keys to enlightenment, the way that they were taught, the children, those who were in um, across Africa, because obviously Kemet is really reflective of the whole of Africa. Um, the knowledge came from Africa to Kemet. We know that we have 42 um, nations who live peacefully in, in, in Kemet from different parts of Africa. And how the, they were taught was that each one of these that we see singly was fed into the others. So really it's, it's a holistic way of teaching and I've really tried to do that in the book. Um, and I'll try to give an example of that. In the book, you can't read this, I'm sure, but um, <laughs> these are the people who've contributed in terms of 
the work that they've done that's been included in, in the book. Um, and they're everybody th that you know, so I haven't produced anyone who's any different from all the training that all of us have had uh, in knowing about these people and reading their wonderful texts. So that should help you feel confident that <laughs> the book is fairly good in that way. Um, the Afrocentric school, the idea of it is that it's a model for teaching and learning. It's a blueprint for full-time schools, part-time schools, Saturday schools and home schools. It's not a rigid thing. The ages and skills come from research that was carried out in Africa that I did with a team of, of people when I was working for UNICEF years ago. But you may use whichever age relates to your children's development. So just because it says at the age of this and that, this is what your child should know, it doesn't matter. Whatever your child knows, you work from that. Your child could be a genius, go straight up to the older children. Your child, you know, could have difficulty learning, start at the beginning. You know, it's not a rigid thing. Um, it can be used to infuse into regular European and other schools that teach how to maintain cultural values and beliefs that disrespect African humanity, especially those of the darkest hue, in the racialized hierarchies of schooling, gender, class, sexuality, age, religion, entertainment, the arts, artificial intelligence, etc. So wherever we find ourselves, where, whichever hierarchy we're in, it's always the darkest skinned people who are the most at threat. And um, what we have to know is that if we're light skinned, we are privileged by this belief. It may not be something that we want, but the truth is that we may get home more easily than, than a person of darker hue. That has to be reality. And we have to recognize that because if we get into the whole race paradigm, then we believe we're superior because we have an easy time. And then we think, oh, we've done everything right. It's impossible to believe, but many of us do believe that, sadly. Um, here, um, this, uh, these are some of the children in the book, depicted in the book. The uh, Brazilian children, the first picture, the Yemen children, the Colombian children, and the third across the top, and then coming down, the Libyan, and then the Peruvian below that, and then the Venezuelan on the right. So it's just a way of showing you, showing the children that these are the children that they can identify with that exist across the world. Um, because sometimes we, we don't know that. We don't know African people today are in all these different places. And this is nothing compared to where they are and all the work that people like Van Sertima have done, Renoko Rashidi and so on in finding the African presence everywhere. Um, here in the book, these are the young children. They're First Nations children of the Americas. And they, as a result of all the Africans that, that traveled the world and migrated from the continent 70,000 years ago and relocated to different parts of the world, the First Nations people in particular uh, millions have been wiped off the face of the earth. Um, these people are our people. They look genetically different. I mean, not genetically, but phenotypically mm -hmm. different. But their culture speaks volumes. They believe the same things as the ancient belief in uh, female, male, man and woman reciprocity, respect for the mother and father, respect for children, respect for nature, respect for life, respect for the ancestors, and so on. These are the same people, but they look phenotypically different. But because of their African ways and beliefs, 
it was very easy to wipe them off the face of the earth because they welcomed strangers as African people do. So I wanted to make sure that we understand that these uh, uh, children are the descendants of ancestors that built incredible uh, societies and civilizations, um, much in the same form as, as the phenotypical African did. So they've really taken, you know, carried on the African traditions in building pyramids and writing and reading, sailing ships, knowing the stars and the planets and so on. Um, so here we have um, the children from Belize on the left, the Mexican next to them, the Canadian children, the US American child and the Brazilian at the bottom. And uh, these are all people who are all, all under threat. They're our, f our family. That's what the book is trying to say, that we need to recognize our connections. Um, for six and seven year olds, I just picked this out because I thought it might be interesting. Um, in the book, it's just saying that by this age, sentence structuring should be in place and spelling and ongoing development. The young scholars are reading and writing well. They usually are, but it doesn't mean that they always are. As I said, you don't impose that upon the child. Um, they're knowledgeable about the reasoning for the need to read and, and write. Writing is an art form. It's a tradition of our people. It's an art form and should continue be, to be taught as an art form. Um, wrist and hand movements are becoming easier for children around this age, so they're able to, uh, you know, perf perform write very w well at that time. They often think that they can't accomplish what they perceive as perfection immediately. They can be really put off. They think it's something to do with them. We're all extra sensitive in this society. And they can feel that they could never uh, write well. Um, but um, by comparing their early attempts with their current achievements, they can recognize that one can only improve through experience. At the same time, they are learning the concept of history and change. So my example here is of applied mathematics. This man was a farmer who grew cassava, but he could not make enough for his family to live. Um, he was given the chance to chop down hardwood trees in his area of Africa for more money than he had ever had. He traveled 60 kilometers to where the trees are. He can cut down 40 trees per day with his chainsaw that the foreign co company lent him. The foreign company pays him an average of $6 per tree. Now, this is really in terms of what do we what we are using trees for and actually it's a table when the children look at a table like this they need to know how does that happen yeah. otherwise they just think it's right. there right. Right. you know so that's a way of uh introducing them um the, uh, Okay, the man cannot afford to grow food to eat. He must earn money to buy food for his family. How much can the man earn in a day? In the foreign country, hardwood is worth a hundred times more. In this African country, more than half the population earns eight cents per month. How much can a person who earns eight cents per month earn in one year? Soon, there'll be no more hardwood trees left in this country. What happens to the climate when trees are cut down? Deforestation, that needs to be explained. Next, the trunks are taken to a depot and are sewn, sawn into planks. S sample calculation, it costs roughly $6 per tree to cut 
the journey to the mill with the driver truck and petrol costs one dollar. To get the log to the mill costs one dollar. It costs six dollars per log to cut. The mill charges two dollars to cut the trees into planks. The planks travel by ship in containers to the country that you live in. The cost to the ship planks to the country must take into account how many planks are being shipped, how long does it take, and how much fuel does the ship use. Okay, the planks will then be sent by train or truck to the destination of shops at Selwood. The shops will charge a certain amount for the wood to cover the cost to get the planks to the shop. The more planks the shops buy, the cheaper the plank becomes. There are some people who want to make the, their own tables for home and some people who want to make many tables to sell. A design for a table has to be made. What type of table would you design? It could be a circle, oblong, triangle, oval, or even a simple square table. How many legs will it have? If you buy your wood to build your table, you will pay what that country wants to sell it at. In some countries, because hardwood does not grow there, it will be very expensive to buy. The people paying the man in Africa to cut down the trees sell the wood for a hundred times what they pay the man to cut down the trees. So when you see a wooden table, you will know that a lot of people who need to live help to make that table. And the, 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 here are three designs of tables. This one on the left is uh, nearly $2,000. So this is just a story to let the children understand the complexity of mathematics, of nature, um, of geography, of money, of society. Um, here, please choose an object for the children, item or product, and research where it came from and how it was made. And while the children are learning mathematics, there will be constant tests to make sure that they're becoming skilled at using the mind as well as the written form of symbols. Now, many children in different parts of Africa who come from farming communities that sell their uh, pro produce um, are wonderful. They, they can be tiny, three, four, five years old, and they understand how much something is worth because they've grown it from the beginning to the selling point. And they understand mathematics at such a high level. But when they go to European schools, um, the teachers think that they don't know mathematics and yet they're skilled business people. How does that happen? So we try to counter that type of uh, way of undermining children's potential um, by not seeing it and um, so on. So this is the table of contents, um, uh, forward introduction, overview, racialization of humanity, reclaiming African knowledge, a culture-based study, e essential factors and findings from the study, Afrocentric curriculum and assessment and locations of African schools. Um, I've said Dr. Asante has spent years infusing African knowledge into Eurocentric schools. The fact is that many of our children are in, are in, who are in the schools that de debase their humanity at the same time. One has to remember because sometimes what happens is that we will, um, you know, take our children to the independent schools mm -hmm. and we will look down on the children that go to the, uh, the state schools and kind of look down on the teachers. But in those state schools, there are wonderfully conscious teachers who stay in the state schools because they know that's where the majority of children are that they can get to. So we, we have to be careful in our assessment and monitoring of 
of the schools themselves because there are great teachers and great students in those schools who have nowhere else that they can be. And so I just wanted to make that point to really end on. And um, I do have just a very uh, small thing to show you, just the curriculum, very briefly, um, in the book. Um, I think I end, I press escape and, and go to the, this one. And I'm looking at, you don't have to read it, I'm just going to show you, um, you know, what's being taught. Uh, the different religions, what they are, what they're supposed to mean. Um, African people understood that everything in life was made from energy, including humans, animals, plants, rivers, deserts, clouds, etc., etc. And it's just to give, you know, philosophical, spiritual understanding always throughout the book or throughout the years. Um, so that, that they get the ancient African feature and aspect of the teachings. Um, this is for the children of eight and nine years old, so they will be explained that, um, you know, what the ancient um, d uh, divinities, what they represented, and, um, you know, just to tune into, this is part of the cultural uh, history and knowledge that is being transmitted. Um, so they learn about my arts and the meaning of my arts um, and how the judges and lawyers always thought of my art before they went into court so that they would be wise and make the correct decision. Um, picture of my art. Um, So they have to name two African cultural ideas that we still practice. Do you know creation story? Find one and explain that in the classroom setting. Um, and then logic, the ancient game of Senet, which is an ancient Egyptian game, which um, is really um, sort of the precursor to chess. And so um, they uh, explains here how to play the game of chess, what, what chess means, how to play it. Um, and also they, they know, they will know that in Africa, chess uh, in the schools is a very powerful, has a very powerful influence and that you know, the idea in, in the book is that we will be able to have Zoom meetings with different schools all over the world and actually, you know, play chess with, with other schools in Africa and so on. So this is just directions on how you would play that game. Um, it's And it, again, it brings in all kinds of social constructs and uh, and is a mathematical game as a street strategic game and so on and then what it does in developing memory including concentration logical thinking etc and then just briefly looking at the planets understanding of planets and um, eventually there are the planets with as the, their real sizes. And then a discussion on the Dogon of Mali and their ancient history and knowledge of the solar system because as we know, they saw these uh, planets, stars, and they had no planets and they had no, so we think, but it probably isn't really true. But... Um, 
So anyway, they knew these planets, and so that's just discussion about what they knew. And also the movement of the moon, how the moon shines and so on, uh, movement. And um, so finally, yeah, the phases of the moon and so on, and the children can look at these things so that they can see that reality. Um, how long it takes to orbit the Earth and so on. Um, what happens for the lunar eclipse. And then, uh, you know, that's it's very scientific, but it's very musical. It's very, uh, you know, music is depicted as a healing, a way of healing people. And so... Uh, you know, drumming and various ways of expressing music and dance and singing and so on, a very part of all of this, part of what it is, part of the seven liberal arts and how they all intertwine. Um, and here, one of the things that they're doing is learning how to make uh, a solar oven and so it's just the instructions of how you can do that. Um, and so uh, how solar energy and chemists and so on. So that's all I wanted to show you, just to give you an idea of how the book is for the children. Um, and, and it's really a composite of all the things that... Um, have been learned from all these independent schools, part-time schools, and so on. And one doesn't have to be rigid. You know, if your children have to go, or your grandchildren or great-grandchildren, as in my case, they go to uh, the state schools because you, you can't, you know, take them out. Uh, you, you can infuse, as Dr. Asante has done for years and years, knowledge that the children will grow to understand. And what happens is that they view the schools that they're in in a different way mm -hmm. because you, you're really teaching them how to survive because so many children are forced into being who they are not mm -hmm. um, and they reject the schools quite rightly so. But in rejecting the schools, they now fit into a behavior program, which is a model for taking those children and, uh, and placing them eventually into prison yeah. settings. Okay. So, you know, if, you ch if the children have some understanding of the real situation, then they can actually go to those schools and go through the system more easily because they understand it is a system that is trying to uh, undermine their potential and so you know that's that's i hope it's understandable and that's where i'll end i've probably gone on far too long sorry <laughs> Are there any questions? I'm sorry. Yeah. Hotep. Testing. <laughs> I just want to say that I am very impressed with how thorough this book is. And I am also very impressed with the the way you highlighted the different ways that these concepts can be used in the um, all-important uh, education uh, and feeding of the black mind of, of the child. And it's vitally important because uh, we, can go to, we can go to Ghana in a place where everybody's from um, dark brown to blue black and find exotically beautiful women bleaching their skin because of the lack of Afrocentricity, see what I'm saying? Cultural genocide and all of that. Absolutely. And then it just don't stop there. You go to uh, uh, Black India, see what I'm saying? And you mm -hmm. got the same thing, exotically beautiful women bleaching their skin. But here's what I believe. Now somebody might differ, but here's I really believe that 
if we were to be able to have 10% of the world black African community conscious with repetitions of information of this nature, I believe that the whole uh, paradigm would shift. See what I'm saying? And um, when, once the people understand who they are, what was, what they created, and what was taken for, from them, it's over. So I, this is a blueprint. Okay, so, so question. <laughs> question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Dr. Dove. This is a very inspirational as well as educational. Um, you answered my first question about infusion of uh, uh, Afro centric uh, ed education into uh, existing curriculum. Uh, my second question was what are the goals of your Asian education compared to African centered education? Um, I think they're, they're, they're the same goals. You know, I just, I don't really. Speak into the microphone. Oh, sorry. I, I think that they're really the same goals, that many of us are working towards the same thing. It's about the consciousness of the children and ourselves. Um, and that uh, the reason that I've used Afrocentric um, is for theoretical reasons, that it is a discipline that embraces everything pertaining to Africa. So uh, I've used it because it's theoretically grounded in that way. S and that is my discipline, and I'm an Africologist. But certainly, um, I don't really see differences in the actual outcomes, um, because it's all towards the same, same ends. Um, and perhaps I, I'm playing, I, I'm part of, uh, uh, you know, a move, a movement of uh, seeing ourselves perhaps uh, distinctly different. We're not distinctly different. Um, and... Um, so if if that's the impression I've given you, I apologize for that. So did that answer your question? Uh, well, what was the sort of bit that didn't answer it? Oh, Eurasian. Oh, Eurasian. Oh, goodness. I didn't know you said that at yeah. all. I thought you said... African centered and Afrocentric. Yeah. Oh, Eurasian. Oh, yes, the difference is that uh, the, the Eurasian is, um, is, uh, is culturally uh, racist and patriarchal. It's completely the opposite of, of African yeah. cultural beliefs. I'm so sorry I misunderstood. Uh, yeah, and um, they're pretending maybe through polygenesis, but um, they're pretending that they have no relationship with African people, only um, to have African people as enslaved mm -hmm. to their wishes. Um, so it's completely the opposite, and yet their teachers and educators were African. That's the missing piece from their history and why it's so convenient to begin history in a false place where there are no African people in it. But they are actually African people themselves who've lost their cultural identity. They've lost their ability to, well, they may not have lost their ability, but they have disconnected thoroughly from their African ancestors' cultural beliefs and values, and they themselves don't know who they are. Hotep, Dr. Dove, um, appreciate you sharing your thoughts. Uh, you. Where do we attain your book? Obtain your book. Um, it, it, oh, here it's the book is here. here? Yes, okay. and uh, more thank more. you. Okay, one, one more. One more. Okay. Are there two in the bathroom? All right. Yes. Well, we'll do two, and you can just take notes. We'll do both at the same time. Okay. 
Good afternoon, ma'am. I have two quick questions. One, have you made attempts to introduce your curriculum to inner city public schools, populated by mostly black school students? And the second one, do you think it's part of our reparations that we should have independently run schools owned and operated by us? That's a wonderful idea. I hadn't thought of that myself. Um, <laughs> that would be great. Um, and I have, um, I think, you, to Hugh, Dr. Hugh of uh, Lotus Academy, um, I have introduced and hope that it, it is a, a, a worthy introduction. It's, the, the, it's a wonderful school. I mean, it does everything. It's like teaching a dog new tricks, you know, when an old dog, new tricks, something like that. Maybe that's the wrong thing to say, but you already have the wisdom. But um, I don't know if it would be useful to you. I, I, I would like to know if that's the case, if it is. Hotel. Hotel. Can you give me the, an example of how democracy began in Africa? Yes. Um, it comes out of uh, my Arctic principles, and it really begins with I'm I'm a Jopian theorist as an Africologist, and um, the ancient Africans they built their societies, lives, culture on the reciprocal and harmonious seeking harmonious relationship with the with the uh, mother and the father who produce life and culture and it was this relationship to seek this harmonious relationship which makes african culture so special um, because it is out of this that my arts can exist because my art is based on truth, honesty, reciprocity, harmony, and many things. But, but the idea of, of democracy began in that way, through those principles, because that's what democracy is actually supposed to be. We don't practice it, and we just use the word as if, you know, We've got democracy, but what does it mean when you've got people starving, when you've got people in jail for nothing, all these things? I mean, what does that mean? But the real idea of it began in that sort of foundational relationship. Fantastic. Okay, let's give Harry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. This is, a, this is a, a wonderful, wonderful lecture, pa part of the understanding of that we have to have always, I guess, as individuals who are engaged in, in the whole process of educating ourselves, is to understand that many times when the Greeks say things, the Greeks got it from Africa. Uh, particularly this concept of democracy, as Dr. Dove has explained, the notion of uh, democracy, as she has explained, has to do with a whole ethical value system of ma'at. That's a value system where you are having reciprocity among people. And when the Greeks saw that in Africa, then they went back and they named it uh, democracy, meaning the rule of the people. But, but actually, it's, not, it's more than elections. Sometimes people think of democracy, if you got elections, then you got democracy. No, that's just one aspect of democracy. Democracy is a value system. It's how you treat other people. It's how you value other people. Don't tell me they got democracy in Mississippi. Don't tell me they have it in Alabama, where they don't want African people to have fair representation. That's not democracy. Right. So you can say, okay, you can vote, but you can only vote in a particular area, or you can have only a particular aspect of it, you see? But that's not democracy. So, it, so her point is an excellent point, and we give her credit, and we thank you so much for having given us such a powerful uh, understanding of the, the book, The Afrocentric School. One last thing I want to say is um, 
Because I just have to say this. Uh, I, I looked at television the other day when they were releasing the uh, hostages from, from uh, in, in uh, Palestine and Israel, and, and they said that there were some Thai people released from Thailand. And I asked myself, nobody ever told me that there were Thai people in Israel. Nobody ever, I never heard that before. And then it occurred to me after listening to Dr. Dove's presentation about hierarchy and about how people see other people, that this notion of the tie, the black people as servants and as domestics and agricultural workers that we didn't even know were over there, working in the kibbutzes and so on. That's, that's a revelation. And it's the same revelation in the United States of America. It's the same thing. People are hollering about immigration. We don't want immigrants here. And yet at the same time, the farms in the Midwest and the Southwest of this country could not exist if it did not have Mexican workers. The same thing is in Europe. What's all that about? It's about the differentials that people have in their minds about this polygenesis, that these are humans, but these are different types of humans than we are. That's the way they think about it. And let's think about that. Reflect on it. As African people, we come out of a strong and long history of oppression and victories over oppression. We know how this thing works. And we understood apartheid. We understood the ANC and the PAC. We understood what they were fighting for, for freedom and liberty. Let's not forget that we are ourselves. We have always been, uh, at least as long as we've been in this country, victims. But we have also been the most noble people in this country because our nobility and our resilience really can never be stopped. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank Brother Kareem for being incredibly technically superior. I want, I want, I want to thank Dr. Jabali Ade for getting us fired up. And all of you who've come and those of you who dedicate and devote and uh, donate so much to this institution. We call upon our ancestors, far and near, mother of our mothers, the father of our fathers, to render mercy, to bear witness for the liberation and the victory of all oppressed people forever. And we leave here saying, it is done.